Um, great. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to the Cumberland County Transition House Association presentation on the story of how we brought our men's program into uh, this uh, year. De decade generation um, uh, and it's been a process so we thought we'd just share our story um, as we go along so about us the Cumberland County Transition House Association has a goal of eliminating uh, violence in intimate partner relationships and also to promote peace in the homes of our community. We are a border town uh, between Nova, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, Amherst, Nova Scotia. So our community stretches both into Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Um, we try to do this by not only working with women, but trying to help the whole family unit. And this is done by interacting with both those who have caused harm, those who have harmed, and any children involved. Um, we at the Cumberland County Transition House Association, and I will say that we call ourselves a CCTHA, believe in a holistic approach with the goal to one day no longer having to offer the services we provide. So today we have uh, the three of us here. Um, I'm Don Ferris. I'm the executive director at the CCTHA. I started here in uh, 2017, coming from the Elizabeth Fry Society um, of mainland Nova Scotia. And I've been a passionate uh, person and advocate uh, for feminist issues for over 25 years. I currently sit on the Nova Scotia Highest Risk DV table as co-chair. Director of the uh, a director of the Board of Fans, which is the Transition House Association of Nova Scotia. And I'm also currently uh, the chair of the Board of CANSA, the Cumberland African Nova, uh, Nova Scotia Association, as an ally. Um, we are trying hard to uh, bring us African Nova Scotias to help set in the leadership roles um, that I'm happy to let go of at some point in the future. So I'm a strong feminist, activist, socialist, trade unionist. I'm an abolitionist of pro, uh, prison, anti-poverty advocate, and a strong ally to the 2SL, GBT, T+, and BIPOC communities. I consider myself a comedian. Um, I don't apologize for that. So I live in Nova Scotia with my husband and two dogs. I'm the mother of three grown women and I have two grandchildren who are six weeks apart and both turning three in a, uh, in a couple of months. So, um, Lisa. Oh, you have to take yourself off mute there. Uh, I'm Lisa George. I've worked for the Cumberland County Transition House Association since 2012. Uh, I started as a night support worker, then went to a women's support, current support worker, and I've been working in the new directions office now for about three and a half years. Um, I'm the mother of two children, and I am raising my granddaughter, Kelly. Hi, I'm Kelly Merritt, and I have been with the CCTHA since 2014. I've held various positions over my time here, and the most recent one is the operations manager. I'm a mom to three grown men. I have two granddaughters that are both five, and I have another grandchild on the way in June. Great. Thank you. I wish this was more interactive and we could find out who's with us, but um, so we'll just, you know, truck along. Um, our history, or as we like to call it, the herstory. Um, our founding grandmothers began working within this community in the late 70s and early 80s. They had a network of interested um, families who wanted to help out. And there was a series of hiding places, uh, people with in-law suites or apartments in the garages or basement suites, uh, someplace that using a phone tree system, when a woman and her children needed to flee, they could use the phone network and, and house them safely. Um, in, in, in community, hidden within community. Um, and that was the late 70s, early 80s. Things weren't getting better. And uh, the CCTHA, the Cumberland County Transition House Association was officially registered as an organization in 1986. That was the year I graduated high school. And so I can't even imagine, um, you know, what people were doing back then when I was, you know, graduating high school. Anyway, um, in the 90s, the early 90s, a shelter, uh, funds were raised and a shelter was built. And our shelter was built to be a communal living shelter. We did, it wasn't a house that was purchased that was renovated. We actually have a um, 
a purposeful built shelter. And then in the a couple of years after that, they did an addition to increase and expand the office space for workers. Um, the one thing that I would say I'm very proud of the fact that our originating founding grandmothers had the foresight back in the 80s to know that if you weren't working with men, um, you weren't solving the problem. You were just hiding and sheltering women and children in the hopes that they would move on to new relationships. So um, the holistic approach has always been part of our organization. Um, and I've been told that that was... Um, very controversial throughout Canada, that it was uh, seemed to be an odd fit for a feminist organization working with women, also working with men. Um, things were busy. The men's program was always housed within our shelter in that the staff working with the men would meet one-on-one -on -one individually within our transition house. But group programming was done in locations like the schools or basements of churches or wherever community could host a, um, a program, a group setting. Now, fundamentally, I'm not sure that churches or schools were safe places for lots of folks, but that's where it was for, for many years. Um, since coming here for me in 2017, um, we took those the men's program and, and worked with our funders and moved off site. So we got a space that is owned uh, for men. Men can show up. There's There was a real stigma showing up at the, the shelter front door, knocking on as a man, fearful that anybody driving by would be pointing, there goes a you know an abuse of man, um, trying to, try to access our services. So now we're in a, a building with other professional offices. And uh, by the way, the courthouse is just on a couple floors above us. So nobody would know why anybody was coming in or out of the building. And from day one, we've seen an increase of men reaching out proactively to self-refer to look for services. But uh, before I get to there, we, we um, at the same time, just before the world shut down, we identified, I had some concerns uh, with the way that the Duluth model, we use the Duluth model since the inception, and I think the Duluth model is still used in most places in Canada today. Um, we didn't have a great success rate of, of ha having men um, graduate. We had a drop-off rate that was over 50%. So we had less than half of the men participating in our uh, Duluth model. And maybe it was just the ver our version of the Duluth model um, that was not helping. Um, we, we asked men to tell us all of the versions of their domestic violence and the abuse they used. Then we would meet with their partners or ex-partners to find out how much they lied and diminished about their harm and we would hold that mirror up to them and show them how they diminished um, their realities. Um, so our, at the same time we moved off site, our funder got involved to say uh, we need to change. We, we, we need to um, get a new program of, for men that would help them navigate and graduate. So um, that's what we did. So we were introduced to Todd Augusta Scott. Sorry, I have to flip back and forth between slides. So we did not create this program. We worked with Scott, uh, Todd, uh, Augusta Scott, uh, hired him and he came in to do training uh, on his program of safety and repair. Todd is a therapist, a clinician. Um, he's the ED of Bridges, the um, men's program in Truro, Nova Scotia. And his manual safety and repair uh, was brought to us to have a trauma-informed lens of programming. Todd worked with men originally in the Duluth model, um, but he'd stopped years ago. He'd stopped using that model, and he found a new way of gauging men and bringing their pasts and their trauma into the conversation. Todd worked with men to identify their core beliefs and help the men come to their own conclusions about how they were diminishing the harms they were causing, so we were happy to work with him. He was having success working with men, and those men were making changes in their lives in a trauma-informed way. So um, there were challenges in that first year at the end of 2019 and into 2020. Um, neither former staff working in the program wanting to move away from the old version of accountability, and we struggled as a team to figure it out, and eventually decisions were made to part ways. And I fundamentally believe that change is good. And so we moved forward. And, um, you know, if if this if you weren't able to to want to 
change, I was happy to help uh, support women moving on with their careers and lives into other areas where they felt they were meaningfully impacting others. Um, now I want to point out the fact that most programming done throughout this country to help men move away from causing harm is done by not-for-profits. Um, as we know uh, that not-for-profits are not fully funded to hire clinical therapists. We know that women are still being murdered at a rate of one in every 48 hours in Canada. That's our new stat coming out of COVID. It's being claimed as a national epidemic that femicide is, you know, when I started here six, in 2017, it was one woman or girl in every six days. And now we're in a realm of one woman or girl in every two to three days. And in some cases, every 48 hours. So, um, as a country, we're not helping this or this issue uh, by leaving it in the realm of the not-for-profit world. So I just want to say that funding, if we could have our way, we would have therapists everywhere, clinicians everywhere, and 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 it would be a government-owned sector of the healthcare system of, of working with those causing harm. So um, we're sharing our story, um, the story that Todd is the researcher, the clinician, We've brought it here. We've got three years under our belt and we're, we're doing great things. Um, sorry, I've totally lost track of where I was. So, uh, but now we are having great success um, with, uh, with, with men working in a new way. We, we have a 98% success rate of completion and those 2% that did not complete the program. It wasn't because they, they didn't want to, but their mental health issues were serious enough that they were unable to complete. They needed more help. Um, and maybe if they uh, could get the mental health help they need, they can come back and join us and be clients at some point in the future. We now meet men where they're at. We don't judge. We now use language that is non-judgmental. We talk about those causing the harm and those being harmed. We have moved away from things like abusers and offenders and perpetrators. Those are Correction Services Canada language. They're not trauma-informed. We no longer use victim or survivor. We give women the agency and the autonomy to, to identify whether they're a victim or whether they're a survivor. And we certainly, uh, so we, we, we use the the language of those causing harm and those being harmed. Now that's not to diminish that some people cause great harm, but harm is harm. And so uh, offender and perpetrator just doesn't fit well with our lens of, of non-judgment. Um, so today we're sharing our journey of change and of successes. We have modified the program slightly to incorporate some other components of programming that we like through our other men's organizations in Nova Scotia. But fundamentally, if you want uh, the new program, uh, you can buy Todd's book online and bring it to your organization. We did not cr uh, create the program. We've just call our, our own. Um, I did, we did have, uh, when we were changing the roles, um, we di I did have staff go and, and uh, shadow at Bridges. We also shadowed at New, new uh, Leaf, new, new Leaf in New Glasgow. Um, Bridges and Todd's program offered 12 weeks of closed programming, closed group. They had closed group and would go in and in those 12 weeks, they would have a series of discussions that would bring men through the program and um, awareness and creation with purpose. And New Leaf was having great success and they never had anything closed. It was always open group. So men would come weekly and the topics would be organic and they would bubble up. We liked both those models. We brought them both here. So we run with um, both open and closed group. I'll get into that in a bit. So having um, our funders after, well, since the late 80s fund us for a men's program, we finally signed our very first service level agreement a couple of years ago. And in that there were outlying um, expectations and targets and what we were being funded to actually provide. Um, so our funder uh, now gives us, and that's the Department of Community Services of Nova Scotia, and they fund us um, to, to provide three tiers of programming. So tier one, includes low intensity generalized and universal programming to holistically address, promote protective and risk factors across social determinants of health and, and, and creatively uh, engage fathers. And we do all of those things for men that we've done for women 
um, accessing services in our shelter forever. We uh, do the wraparound. So tier one would be the wraparound systems of court accompaniment, important meeting accompaniment. This could be child protective services appointments, legal appointments. Uh, not many men request accompaniment, but we offer it. Um, We've had some good success in helping navigate and in some cases translate what the CPS workers are asking of the men. Um, we do advocacy. We provide advocacy in a way that we would a woman accessing services at Autumn House. Uh, this could be working with CPS workers, their lawyer, a landlord, whatever is helping him to de-escalate in his life. System navigation probation orders, CPS requests, applying for income assistance, applying for legal aid and more. We help men if they uh, need help with system navigation. And as, if you've watched any of the training videos, I'm sure across the country, they're all similar. When a family is dealing with domestic violence, all of the, the parts of our system that touches them, the police, legal aid, uh, men's programming, shelters, CPS, victim services, all of those things are part of the system and can be overwhelming. So we help with, with that and navigate through the system. Knowing you have someone to help you uh, with this is also a de-escalation tool that helps keep men and their families safer. We also do referrals to other agencies, and that could look like employment Nova Scotia introductions, mental health referrals, um, even suggesting calling our Nova Scotia 211 number after hours if they are in crisis. Tier 2 includes uh, medium intensity. Oops, sorry. Catch up with the slides. Medium intensity. Um, Programming to address complex needs that require focused interventions and approaches. And this is where we have our group programs. Um, Strengthening Fathers and Fatherhood Matters are our two distinct programs. So Strengthening Fathers um, is for men in father-like roles. And we do take men that aren't parents yet. Um, and we even take men that are not in fathering roles in any capacity. Like we'll stretch in the intake. Do you have access to nieces and nephews? Are you looking after stepchildren, um, grandchildren, any stretching out? But if there are zero connections to children, we don't turn men away. We will take them and and having the open and closed group running at the same time uh, means we get to tell our funders that we have no wait list. When men come in, access our services, they start an open group until the next closed group runs. And then um, so having men with no children will never produce a wait list for men needing our services. So that's another reason why we like both of those models here. And Fatherhood Matters helps men understand healthy childhood development and encourage them to be better fathers in their lives, to their families, and in their homes. Um, so we do at intake, whether they are referred through a child and family well-being, which used to be called Child Protective Services, uh, whether they're being referred through the Department of Justice, whether their women are referring them when they show up to Autumn House saying, I'm done with, I, I want to be done with him, but he needs help, or we want to stay together, he needs help. We also take self-referrals. Men are starting to come in from community saying, I could use some help. We ask for six months a six month commitment. Because as we know, if you're trying to change your life, six months is like a minimum for changing habits and breaking cycles and unpacking. If you try to lose weight, if you try to quit smoking, if you try to give up caffeine, all of those things can't be done overnight. And so we ask men to voluntarily give us six months of their time. They move into the open group and they start having those conversations on a weekly basis for two hours. When the next closed group starts, they start as a team, they end as a team. Hopefully nobody's dropped off in the meantime. The conversations are purposeful and there's a trajectory of conversations. I will explain all of the 12 weeks. Um, and then after that program, they are officially completed the program. But we ask them to round out the six months going back into open group. And what we're finding is that men still keep coming after the six months. Maybe it's once a month. Maybe it's weekly. Um, some men, while they were moved into 
closed group actually still kept coming a second time in the week. We don't ask that. We just ask you to come once a week for the six months. But sometimes they've needed both those conversations, the unpacking how their week's going in the open group and, and, and hearing and learning from each other about coping strategies, and then also tackling the conversations in, in the closed group. Um, so open group, uh, there's no waiting weekly topic. How was your week? It's two hours and it helps prime them and get them ready for the closed group discussions. It's a safe space and everything about it is confidential. Confidential. Men sign a waiver saying that they understand that the things that they're sharing will be kept confidential and the things that they're hearing that men are sharing is confidentiality. So we've really created a space that's safe and warm and it feels like a men's helping center. Um, they stay in open group until the next closed group starts and that's based on safety and repair by Todd Augusta Scott. There's it's a three-phased approach based on the premise that all people experience some level of harm and everyone has harmed another person. The 12-week topics are first week establishing values and reauthoring identity. So this is done by values in a relationship with your partner values in a relationship with your children and a values in a relationship with yourself. So identifying what your core values are is week one. Then week two, physical safety and uh, unpacking plans for safety, the social determinants of family violence, somatic self-regulation and separating the past from the present. That's a fulsome conversation for two hours. Week three is defining abuse. What is abuse? What is anger and conflict and the differences in both of those things and the distinction between abuse and anger. And so when men are in a group unpacking these things organically, they're able to identify the differences between anger and conflict. And the facilitators are skilled at bringing out men's abilities to identify times that they've been angry or times that there was conflict. Um, the next week, uh, Defining repair and taking responsibility. What is repair? Acknowledging the details of the abuse. Creating a plan to stop the abuse. Acknowledging the effects of the abuse and creating a follow-up plan to repair the effects of abuse. Taking responsibility. And this is where men start to actually identify the, the amount of abuse or the harms that they've caused. Um, the old Duluth model, it was all about pointing it out to them. You caused harm. And most men would say, I was just defending myself. Um, here, walking them through up to this point, they're able to start saying, I've done this. I've done that. I can do this. I will do that. And so unpacking those things for them, defining the repair and taking the responsibility is key. The next week, distractions from taking responsibility and repairing harm. What are some ways a person can minimize harm? What are examples of denying harm? And what are some examples of blaming harm on uh, external factors? So it's easy for humans to, to say, I did this, but because this happened. And so having those conversations based in reality are helpful to unpack some stuff that if you've caused harm, but also have been harmed, in your life, uh, it's important to unpack and pull those uh, topics apart. Uh, the next week would be preparing to repair harm with the person who hurt you. So we know that whether they stay together or not, if there's family and children involved, they're still going to be co-parenting. And so making a plan to preparing uh, for repairing harm with the person you hurt would include acknowledging the details of the abuse, creating a plan to stop the abuse, acknowledging the effects of the abuse, and creating a follow-up plan to repair effects is where things get really interesting and good and the facilitators help with that. Um, the next week is trauma and gender impairing people's ability to repair harm when they have been hurt. So trauma and identifying, identifying when you've been hurt, trauma and asking for what you want, conflict versus abuse, misdirecting anger and separating the past from the present. We all know that sometimes that fight, flight or freeze kicks in based on your past experiences and you're not even aware why you reacted to what you, the, 
the situation in the way that you did. Demanding what you want, repair versus punishment. Repair as avoidance and trauma and accepting what you want from others. So um, while the old Duluth model said anything about your past can't be brought up now because it just is an excuse as to why you're choosing to do what you're doing, we are now really involved with the, of course, your past and your past trauma has has led you down the road to being who you are and unpacking that about your past and accepting and, and moving forward is very helpful for men preparing to repair harm is the next week with the person you hurt so acknowledging the details plan to stop oh sorry we cut and paste that twice um so lastly practicing repair and relationship Acknowledging the details of the harm, creating the plan to stop the abuse and acknowledging the effects of the abuse and creating a follow-up plan to repair effects. During the course of the 12 weeks, um, there are will be setbacks and there will be men who are uh, trying real hard but still make mistakes and and backslide and and we unpack that because we all know if you are trying to quit smoking um and i've never smoked so i'm just explaining what others have told me that there's a little bit of a rel relapse and so what we do is we we talk about that in ways of saying we we've we measure the distance of the episodes and we, we gauge the volume. So maybe there was a hiccup, but it happened like three months after trying to make changes. And it was a lesser volume of violence than in the past. And, and those are things to be not celebrated, but acknowledged that there was still change and there's still growth and that people are people. And so the end goal is to become better and also, uh, not spiraling in shame or or losing you know the bubble to say oh i'm going to be the person i don't want to be anymore i've said for years in in this sector uh if you were to ask a little boy what you want to do when you grow up no little boy would say boy i wish i could grow up and hurt and really hurt the people i love right but lots of things toxic masculinity the patriarchy uh generational trauma generational poverty, under education, under employment, under uh, ability to uh, have all of the opportunities to learn and grow has led people to living lives outside of their core values. So um, we really, really love and believe in the idea of unpacking those things are, are helping move the needle. I, I do want to say, because we are the not-for-profit world on a shoestring budget, we're not therapists, clinicians, and we couldn't afford to hire therapists and clinicians uh, with the funding we receive, we are not going to, with this program, hit the targets of the sociopath, the psychopath, the narcissist, those, those men who programming won't have an effect on. Like, that's the reality. We want to say that we, we, what we're able to do is probably helping 80 to 95% of men. But that 5 to 20% of men that it's just needs deep seated therapeutic approach that I don't know where those places are available in this country. Um, those are still going to be out there. So we're not trying to say that this is the best thing and will change all men. What we're trying to say is that this program will help a great majority of men. And, and, and we've seen that. Um, so after they finish the closed group, they go back to open group to round out their six months. And uh, almost like an AA meeting, men can keep coming and helping access the resources for as long as they need. Our fatherhoods matter, which is still a tier two thing. Uh, our fatherhoods matter is a six week program. It's a weekly basis on a weekly basis that helps men understand child development and their fathering skills. Um, as this program was only created 18 months ago, and we've had a couple sh staff changes in that 18 months, it really hasn't grown as fulsome as it could be. But we have great potential that this and our vision would be that this is not only group uh, programming in a structured conversation way, but we also will get outdoor activities, father and children activities, um, experiential stuff that will help men bond and fathers 
fatherhood matters in ways that the, there is really great potential for this program to to just have somebody uh, and we're currently in the process of hiring somebody right now um, but to take it and 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 grow with a vision of of creating healthy spaces we're a rural community we don't have a brothers and sisters club here or boys and girls club we don't have big brothers we don't have big sisters there's a, lo a lack of resources overall in rural nova scotia so um my vision is that the fatherhood matters program can can expand Finally, our tier three um, funding is uh, and outcomes for the funders is um, we did get small pot of money to hire a clinical therapist. And I'm saying that with the greatest respect that we do have some funds for this, but I had that position open for two years as we tried to find a clinical therapist to work for the dollars an hour that we could afford to pay them um, in rural Nova Scotia. And so for two years it was vacant. But this would include, so the goal of the tier three is uh, high intensity interventions and programming to address family violence, which may include psychotherapeutic and other clinical modalities supported by a certified clinician to address childhood and intergenerational trauma, attitudes, beliefs about violence, etc. So, um, over a year ago, though, we did have a retired psychotherapist from Ontario who'd moved to Nova Scotia decide that she was bored after the pandemic and wanted to get engaged. So um, this is almost uh, like she's giving us her time and uh, is happy to take home what whatever uh, our, our, our we've got forty dollars an hour. $40 an hour to hire uh, a clinical therapist. And as we know, in Nova Scotia, they, a clinical therapist can make 170 some dollars an hour in private practice. So, you know, because she's a, a, a heart with a, a giving spirit and a socialist, it's been a good fit. And so she sees uh, individual men and for sessions, to, but we can't call her a clinical therapist because of the colleges of Ontario and Nova Scotia don't recognize her uh, education and uh, you know, God love Mary Ellen, as she said, um, she got her degree so long ago that there isn't a syllabus left or a professor alive that could credit her here in Nova Scotia. So as long as we continue to call her a psychotherapist, our funder is happy that we have somebody working with men. Um, I'm going to share the screen uh, with Lisa, who is our uh, men's support worker team lead, um, to give some experiential uh, type of um, benefits or how men have really responded to the newness of the of this program. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. First, I just want to expand on the program a little bit. Um, the program is uh, the program we do. It it draws on the practice of narr narrative therapy. So it's writing your own story. So it's really influential for the guys in the in group, because uh, if we hear the story that, you know, you're this terrible person, you're, you're always going to be awful. You'll never account, uh, amount to anything. That's the story we tell of ourselves, and that's the story we live. So the program really creates distinction for people to, tell, to, to write their own story, to, to be who they want to be. So um, I think that's a really important element to include in the conversation. We also talk about the different templates we have um, based on our uh, experiences of trauma or unhealthy relationships on how to express anger, how to resolve conflict, what a healthy relationship looks like and how that impacts us. And so we talk about, you know, what we want. Like, what do you want? How do you want to express your anger? How do you want to resolve conflict? What, what would be an unhelpful and a helpful way to do that? Um, so I just wanted to add that into what you had said because I just thought it was really important. Um, I think when I think about uh, the positive experiences that come from this office, we've had a lot of positive experiences and successes. Um, just recently, well, I guess four or five months ago, one of uh, the fathers that uh, has participated in our program uh, got custody back of his own child and his non-biological child. So he received services. Uh, he took every program here uh, with his goal of getting his children back. 
and he was deemed the protective parent and he's working on the best parent he can possibly be based on and a lot of it's based on you know his own childhood experiences and what he went through and what he doesn't want for them i think that that's a really great um part of program too is that we really talk to guys about what they want for their kids because when we put it in that kind of uh, when we when we say things for that most guys well they want everything for their kids you know I think it's a fallacy to think that we hear a lot that you know this guy doesn't want to participate in his child's life and, and whatnot but when you really talk to the guys they want everything for their kids so I it, I thought that that was a really great thing to talk about was him getting his kids back um, we had I'm just trying to think I guess really one of the most positive things is you know when guys come here it's anger when they come to the door it radiates off them and it's like i don't i don't want to be here i didn't do anything wrong and and it's like as soon as they come to the door they think i'm i'm going to judge them that i've already got them figured out i've got them slotted into a box and as soon as i create that space where we sit and we talk They'll start talking and they'll tell me everything that's going on within their lives and then they start coming so they'll come to program and they'll start talking about things they've never talked about before in their lives they'll think they'll have conversations that they've never participated in and they're engaged they're participating they're thinking about these things um, and it's always the guys that come that are just radiating anger that keep coming back when they're done <laughs> and they'll come and check in so I think that's really the biggest success is that when guys complete they come back and so if someone's in distress they'll come and talk to us and try to talk it through I think that's a way to create safety in a family you know if somebody if they know that there's someone that they can talk to and work their thoughts out through they'll come so that is it at at the end of the day really is that they know that there is a safe place they can come we'll always listen and be non-judgmental um, and we're here for them so that's a big thing um, we also do other things in the office like we have the food pantry uh, last month we gave 21 bags of groceries out so really that helps alleviate the stresses that are going on right now like people are struggling and it really impacts families when you have the stress of trying to find the money to pay for groceries when you're trying to pay for rent when you're trying to pay for for gas and then if you have the added element of cps involved in your life that's just more it's more on top of more and on top of more so i think it's a wonderful thing that we can do it to uh, help the guys like even with groceries it's a help right um by the uh, by the end of this month we'll have 17 clients complete program this year so i think that's a huge success too if i was to look back uh years ago like before i started working in the office i think the numbers were a lot lower um so it really we do have a fairly good success rate we have the odd person that drops out but mostly they'll come back also we do um if somebody can't come to group will help meet their needs by doing one-on-ones so that we can remove barriers anywhere that we can um, and i don't know i just think the program's great myself um, i enjoy i should say i don't really enjoy facilitating but it's the job i've signed up for for the rest of my life <laughs> and i do it <laughs> i enjoy meeting with the guys and i enjoy um listening to them talk about the positive changes they want to make in their lives um i like hearing when they come back to group and they are talking about well you know this week i went against my values but i thought about what i really really wanted and and so i i started thinking about the tools i've learned in group and i started applying them to what i'm trying to do because i don't want to be that person anymore I'm working on change and I'm working on being who I want to be, not who people think I am. So I think that that's really great too. Um, yeah.
I guess that's really all I have to say. <laughs> that's great, Lisa. Thank you. I just will share a story that you let you told me a little while ago that yes. I just loved. So before I get Kelly to speak, yes. I'm going to say I love the fact that you told me one day that a guy who was doing so well had one of those coming in seething in anger, and then months yes. later he's bringing his children into the office to meet the team that had been helping Daddy, yes. and he wanted to show them where he was going. And I was like, that's. I think that that's so powerful that yes. not only was it he's doing better, the children were feeling he was doing better and he wanted yes. you to meet his kids so that the children could meet the people who was helping daddy get better, right? Like that's yes. just, yeah. Thank you for yes. sharing. No problem. Kelly, uh, I've asked Kelly to join us today to share uh, some interesting plans uh, that we've just embarked on in Autumn House. So Kelly, go ahead. So, so yes, I'm Kelly and hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so Don had asked me to join and so I'm the operations manager at Autumn House and that is under the umbrella of the Cumberland County Transition House Association. So we work with those who have been harmed, um, so anyone that identifies as female. So looking at the holistic approach that our organization has taken to, to uh, assist and help families with domestic violence and family violence, the women's support counselors that work in the shelter were given the opportunity to spend some time with Todd Augusta Scott, the creator of the safety and repair program. This was super important to me. I was a woman support counselor at the time. Um, so it was super important to me to spend this time with Todd because sometimes families choose to stay together. If there's children involved, there's co-parenting. So there's a relationship between these two individuals for the for the long haul. And how do we help support in in a healthy relationship in whatever way that looks? Things that uh, Todd had shared and and uh, spoke on resonated with me, especially the work around values and the importance they play in our life. It's like the foundation for me. It's the foundation of who we are. Another thing that I noticed uh, when talking to Todd and things that I've heard in individual counseling, uh, support counseling with the women that I work with um, was the impacts that the violence has uh, played in their lives and <clears throat> how it affects them in their everyday life. And it really, you hear a lot of similarities even though everybody's experience is an individual uh, thing. So I listened to the impacts on the abuse um, or the, the violence in the relationships. And I listened to Todd talk about his safety and repair program. And then earlier this year, I was given the opportunity to co-facilitate with Lisa for a group of women who have been referred to New Directions, the men's program through the domestic violence court we have in our area. And during this time, in delivering the program, I thought with some adjust adjustments, we could bring this to anyone that's accessing services at here at Autumn House. So that's where we went. So the safety repair program gives a space and flexibility to integrate and complement parts of our current program while moving forward with the program that Don had outlined for us earlier in the presentation. I have often heard women say, yeah, but I hit him or I pushed him or I yelled or I yelled first. So first thing we do is we kind of unpack that and address the fact that it's not okay for anybody to harm you for any reason. And then we talk about the values. We bring it back to the values. If you've identified respect as your value or it's something that is super important to you, um, in engaging in that behavior, were you living true to that value or were you moving away from it? So those were kind of some of the examples and some of the examples we use with women individually. And again this year, and we are currently running another program that have been um, women that have been th referred through the DV court system. I'm sorry, I lost my spot. Um, while the program is mandatory because of the the outcomes if they meet the the requirements they get an absolute discharge we strive to support in a trauma-informed manner to encourage engagement and attendance 
this group in particular have been amazing. Um, during one of the ends of one of our sessions, we do the checkout. And what I was really shocked, happy to hear is that they believe that this program is something that anybody could benefit from. That the program starts with self and self-awareness and you build on it from there. So I, I really appreciate in the program that it's not that finger pointing, you did this, you did that, because we continue to punish somebody who has caused harm through our you know, judicial system. You come to group, you're being punished again. So this is one of the things that I really appreciate it. Um, what else is there to say? We always bring it back to the parenting component and that can be challenging in particular. If I use the group that we're working with right now, we have um, four women taking it. All four women have kids and none of them are in their care. So we try to be really mindful of that too. So we might relate it back to, you know, nieces and nephews or, you know, kiddos in your life or whatever that looks like. And they have been really, really receptive to it. So some of the exciting things. So in the new year, we are going to kind of model some of the same group um, things that are going on in new, direct, new directions. So we're going to start an open program once a week for anybody that wants to attend. And that would kind of be a holding spot. And as soon as this closed group ends, we want to roll right into the next one. So it's it's going to be a great year. I can't wait to see the results of it. And I've, yeah, this has been a pleasure and, and it's been a really great experience and an eye opener for me. So that's me. That's it. Thank you so much. Um, we do uh, in counseling in the, the autumn house in the women's shelter, we do the power and control wheel and we do the red flags and we've been doing that for decades and it has not eliminated the problem. And so bringing uh, self-awareness, core value focused um, program to those both causing harm and being harmed might eventually start helping eliminate the need for our jobs. Um, thank you both, uh, Lisa and Kelly, for that. Um, there is a couple of minutes. I, I don't know how this would work, but if there's somebody, maybe if you have the ability to chat and ask a question, uh, we'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. Um, and if, if, if not, we've enjoyed your uh, attendance today. Sorry we didn't get to see you. Um, we At the end slide, I do have our contact information um, in case anybody thinks of something overnight and they want to send us a question later. Uh, thank you so much for informative discussion. Question, we just appreciate, oh, appreciate your appreciation. Thank you, Jen.